Hello and welcome to the Curious Life podcast. My name is Yana Firestone and today I'm joined by Luke McLeod. Luke, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, good to be here. Well, people might know you from the very well-loved season of (laughs) Sophie Monk on The Bachelorette here in Australia. And then you had a, a little dalliance into Bachelor in Paradise as well. I did, yes. But there's a whole lot more to you and there's lots you were doing before the show and mm. plenty that you've been doing after the show that's really meaningful and mm. we'll get to all of that. Yeah. But I guess people might be interested to know about what you were doing kind of before you hit our TV screens. Yeah. I think I read somewhere that you might have even been in India mm-hmm. in the lead up to the show. That's true. Yes, very much so. Yeah, it was uh, it was probably only about three months before the show started, mm-hmm. where I spent a fair bit of time in India, and there is a whole story actually to the reason why I went to India. At that point in my, in my life, uh, a few things kind of broke down, which was quite intense. Um, I had uh, the end of a ten year relationship, uh, a business venture that kind of went south, almost um, you know broke me. Uh, family members were going through a rough time and my um, my brother-in-law and my dad were diagnosed with cancer within the same month. Wow. Um, had a falling out with my best friend. So all these things just seemed to happen in such a, a short period of time. And I th- up until that point, I, I think I lived a fairly comfortable, you know, s- secure life. As mm-hmm. I said, I had a great relationship. Had a, business was going well. And then it literally just imploded all within three months. Oh, my God. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I just kind of got to a point where I was like, wow, what, what do I do? And I, I remember I was sitting in my bedroom and I, and I literally just threw up a prayer. I'm, I'm not totally religious. I'm, I would call myself spiritual, but I'm not religious. I still don't know God or what that is out there. But I, I threw one up and I said, look, send me a sign because I'm struggling. I don't know by myself. I don't know where to turn, what to do. Yeah. And um, I remember opening up my laptop <clears throat> and the first thing that popped up is Netflix as, as it usually does <laughs> yeah. when you open up your laptop yeah. and there was a new uh, documentary on the top screen which auto played and it was about Ram Das, um, who is uh, was a professor at Harvard and uh, got kicked out for actually experimenting with psychedelics mm. um, and was very much into meditation and he got kicked out and went to India mm-hmm. so I watched this documentary and I was like okay maybe there was something in the back of my head that I was like about India for a long time and uh, and then said, okay, so I'll pull out the atlas. I'll have a look. And there was a little town in the northern part of India where Ram Dass spent a lot of his time. And it was called McLeod Gange. And I was just like, this has to be a sign. Like, that's my surname. Yeah. And then I looked into more of it. And that's where uh, the Dalai Lama has set up as an exile in India. Oh and I was like, I, I just, just felt that overwhelming sense I needed to go there. So I literally booked a ticket with what I had left, um, flew out within the next couple of days and found myself uh, in India on a one-way ticket. I didn't know how long I was going to be there for. And uh, just literally immersed myself. I stayed with uh, in a homestay mm-hmm. with a local Indian family right up in the kind of foothills of the Himalayas in McLeod Gange and uh, just went to this temple every day and, and was fascinated with their culture, their tradition, the meditation practices. And at, while I was over there, I also spent time in an ashram. I met someone who a lot of people call you than a guru or something like that but it was just someone I, I had a really deep connection with and uh, you just kind of listen to what they say and take it on board you don't really question too much you just listen mm. and I remember him saying uh, one day look you should really do something you know that's going to put you out of your comfort zone and I'm like well, I thought this is me being <laughs> here he's like yeah you're right but there is something uh, soon that you know will, will pop up and I'm like okay so I, I, I got back to um, Australia not long after that and about a week after I got back, I got a call from casting director at Warner Brothers saying, hey, do you want to do, do this? And at first I was like, no way. That's not me. Like I couldn't yeah. think of anything further from what would you know really make me feel uncomfortable. Mm. But then I thought back to what he said and I was like, maybe this is it. I couldn't think of anything else that would really put me out of my comfort zone and putting your face on but national yeah. television on a dating show. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then I was like, you know, what's the chances? You have to go through a bit of a process. So, yeah, one thing led to the next and there I was standing and kind of meeting, yeah, Sophie Monk. So that was uh, that 
that journey. Yeah. Talk about a 180 from the <laughs> ashram in India to suddenly front and center on The Bachelorette. Yeah. Yeah. Completely polar opposite, you know, yeah. as far as what people would associate with who I am, I suppose, or my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And that comes up a lot as to why, why would you do that? You know, you seem very different to the type of person that would do that. But I, I'm big on breaking down stereotypes and, you know, doing things that challenge you and, and putting yourself in situations that you're very unfamiliar with, meeting people who are very dissimilar to you. Because I think that's where you grow the most, you learn mm-hmm. the most about yourself. And I think today, in today's time, we isolate ourselves so much. We we put our blinkers on, you know, with the people that we feel comfortable with. And, and sometimes that's great, mm. but it's also opposite in the way that it makes us feel very defensive. Mm. And we're so opinionated now. And, and I, I just find when you go and talk to people who are not like you or completely different to you, it gives you perspective. Yeah. You know, you're not so judgmental. You're, you don't criticize as much. And mm. I, I certainly think we could all do a little bit more of that these days. Totally. Mm. I mean, I'm guilty as anyone of, you know, getting down the rabbit hole on Instagram and yeah. spending countless hours just looking at what other people are doing and making judgments instead of actually being out there and living my life. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the the whole algorithm and social media is based off that. I mean, mm. as I said, in some ways it's good. Like I like surfing. So if I see a, uh, a surfing photo and I double tap on it and like it, that then tells Facebook to send me more surfing videos, yeah. right? Which is nice. Yeah. But it also is what it's doing is it's tunnel visioning us. Mm. So we don't see anything else other than what we want to see. Yeah. So we're missing out on so much. And as I said before, it's also kind of creating this sheltered world Mm. where we get so defensive and judgmental on anyone that's slightly different to us. Yeah. So I think it's so important to do things that you wouldn't necessarily have done, like go on reality TV. And whenever I get people come up to me and go, I would never be able to do that. I can understand, but I I try to encourage them to go, you really should. Yeah, open yourself up um, to doing something like that Um, because that's where, as I said, you learn the most, you grow the most. Mm. And it's been a real blessing in disguise for me because what I do now in the space that I'm passionate about with meditation and that is I feel like I'm reaching an audience now that probably wouldn't have been exposed to something like meditation or giving it a go. Mm. Um, Again, generalized statement, but a lot of people who watch those type of shows might fit into that category probably haven't done meditation before so it's been really good to reach that audience and there's nothing more that gets me excited than receiving a message from someone that says i would have never thought i would have given something like meditation a go thank you so much it's really helped me out totally so did this philosophy for you is this something that you've come to in hindsight or when you were spending that time in India and even in the time before that, mm. were you able to kind of think about things in this balanced way? Is this some, something you've always been? Uh, I think I've always had a fairly calm nature. Okay. But, um, and, and I've, I've been into meditation for close to 10 years. So I, I've practiced meditation for a, a fairly long time. The original reason why I got into it though was quite unlike why most people I think are drawn to meditation Mm -hmm. Uh, for me I was in my mid-20s and uh, I remember reading an article in a business magazine and people who I really look up to in business and in sporting they did a study and they found that this a number one characteristic of people who were successful again people who I looked up to was that they meditated Mm -hmm. and I just found that fascinating because that up until that point I always thought that meditation was for hippies or some yeah. sort of woo-woo thing, you know. And <laughs> yeah. So I decided to give it a go and I found it did help me out a lot within my work. You know, mm-hmm. I found I was more focused. I wasn't procrastinating as much. I felt clear in my decisions. But it wasn't until that breakdown point, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, was when I really turned to it and it helped me out through those times. Mm. And then I really thought there's something to this and needed to kind of try to do what I could to share it with other people and introduce it in a way which is relatable and accessible to other people. Yeah, yeah which is definitely what you're doing. Yeah. If we just follow things along chronologically, so sure. you've had this immersive experience in India, which I can imagine would have been quite transformative and would have 
put you in a really good place after all of that grief that you'd been through. Mm. And then suddenly you are at the mansion (laughs) as one of the suitors for Sophie Monk on The Bachelorette. Did you know that it was going to be Sophie when you were put through? We found out about two weeks before filming. Generally, they don't let, I think, people know because Mm -hmm. it's the whole surprise element. But because I think Sophie, obviously Sophie's a um, celebrity. Yeah. Uh, and it had kind of been leaked or come out before. So they were pretty upfront about that. And it was an interesting moment when they did actually let me know it was going to be her. Like I actually then was very close to pulling out. Okay. Because I was like, well, you know, questioning the intentions of it. You know, mm. is she just purely using this for further her career and, you know, stay in the media and that. But, you know, I, I came back to the fact that, like, who am I to judge, right? Mm. You know, it was just one of the. The, the classic lesson that I just learned is yeah. like reframe yourself from judging until you meet the person and even then yeah. give them the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. So I thought, who am I to, you know, to, to say that? So I thought I'd, I'd go in there with an open book yeah. um, and uh, just see what happened. Yeah. So, yeah. And what did happen was you became very quickly one of the front runners, slightly overshadowed by Jared and his intensity. <laughs> um, but, yeah. you know, you were definitely the favourite for a long time and was that – was that a real experience for you? I've spoken with a couple of people like Sam Wood and Alicia Aitken Redburn, right. and yeah. um, they talk about how quickly the cameras kind of disappear mm. when you're really just in the experience. And at first it can be a bit weird, but then you really genuinely are forming connections with people and yeah. it becomes real. So what was that like for you? Yeah, um, I, I really did try to be myself as much as possible there. And, and try to block out the cameras. And I think they do a fairly good job of trying to, you know, be discreet. Mm. So it's not really in your face. They're kind of, they're around. And if you yeah. really look around, you can see them. But, you know, they want to kind of capture what's happening within the moment. So, okay. you know, you, you are aware. But I was, as I said, I, I really do try to, uh, in that experience, be myself and, and just go with the flow. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it was, I was, you know, the favourite there for a while, but it, it got to a point where you really do have to be honest. And in my situation, it was, I, I thought she was lovely, but I just didn't think I, I saw myself with her. Yeah. So then what do you do, right? Mm. Because you're on the sort of receiving end. So yeah. you just have to be honest and, you know, they can edit whatever they like, but I was, you know, had a chat with the producers and uh, the other people and say, look, I don't know if this is going to work out. I think she's lovely, but to myself with her. So yeah. then it's really over to them on how they want to make that work. So, yeah, I think I was about like six or something. So wow. I think there was about six guys left. And there was mm. a seven one to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is that really, I mean, <clears throat> that's really interesting because you don't really get to hear much about like the contestants really having a say in mm. whether you're going to be there or not. And it's always kind of portrayed that everyone's so grateful and excited to be there and so into it. And then... yeah. You know, it's good to hear that you actually get, you can still have those real conversations about your involvement. Oh, 100%. I, mm. I think, you know, the, the producers and the show, they're very, very smart people, mm. you know, and they, they can pick up whether you're trying to put it on and that can then turn into a whole other editing nightmare. Yeah. So I think they appreciate people who are just upfront and honest and that's what I, I tried to be and yeah. that's how it turned out. So yeah. Yeah. So what's it like? I mean, I, I can kind of imagine what it's like to be in a house full of other competing women and all the challenges that come from that dynamic. Yeah. But what's it actually like being in a house full of men who probably are all there for different reasons and some <laughs> maybe there for airtime and a profile and others who are desperate for the attention of <laughs> Sophie? Yeah. How do you manage all of those personalities and that mm. energy? Oh, it's a, it's a fascinating dynamic. Mm. It really is. And again, that's the whole point of the show is that they cast characters. So yeah. you, you'll notice that there's almost a very similar characters each season. Mm. So you have the, the stage five clinger. Yeah. You know, you've got the really relaxed guy. You've got yeah. the funny joker one. Mm. You've got the villain, you know. So yeah. there's a consistent sort of flow with the characters and who they cast. Mm-hmm. So it creates a fascinating dynamic, you know. Yeah. For me, it... it I'm quite a relaxed sort of guy, so I was more so the mediator. So mm-hmm. whenever drama would happen, I would yeah. be the one that would generally step in to try to keep the peace. Okay. So, you know, we I even did meditation sessions in the mansion, you know, wow. with all the guys just to kind of help them chill out a bit. And yeah. Even times where I was like, 
you know, with Jared because he's quite an intense sort of guy obviously on the show and can be. I was just like, you know, having lots of conversations with him and, you know, even sometimes saying, mate, do you need to go and release a bit of pressure? <laughs> so for, you know, yeah. I was just like, because he's so caught up, mate. But yeah. Yeah. You should take some time, mate. Do that. <laughs> How was, was that well received? Yeah, it was. Yeah, okay, he came. Back, he good. came back. You know, he's yeah. looking a lot um, happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be honest. I was yeah, just like, yeah. Yeah, mate? Was, yeah. Okay, good idea, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay, so you were carrying that through, so it wouldn't have been a surprise to any of the guys on the show that mm. you know meditation, you know, is where your you you know you found your lane. Yeah. So. After leaving the show, it wasn't all that long afterwards that you popped back onto our screens mm. in the middle of Fiji on Bachelor in Paradise. Was that another complex decision for you to go back on TV? Or- yeah, it, it, it was. Mm-hmm. Um, again, initially I was resistant to it when they asked me. Mm-hmm. But I, I found after the first show it was quite overwhelming mm. and I didn't really quite know how to handle... I mean, I knew there was going to be... Obviously, you kind of know if you're going to be on national television, there's going to be attention, right? So I I just didn't quite know what to expect. I don't think people really know what to expect. Mm. And I think um, Sophie's season being a celebrity was quite a a big one as well. So, and again, as I said, like I left, even though I didn't make it to the end, like there was a period there where I think I was a front runner. So the attention was quite heightened. So, and I I didn't quite know how to deal with that. Mm. I went to New Zealand for um, a month or so would work over there just to kind of get away okay. and it got to a point where I was where they asked me and I was like well if if I'm going to meet someone maybe someone who's gone through very, something very similar to what I've gone through yeah you know that can that I can relate to knows the experience that makes sense mm-hmm. because you can relate to your own sort of journey and your story that you've gone through and yeah. I think their intentions are, are probably more true rather than someone who might be just coming after you for certain yeah. reasons so so I thought, you know what, you know, let's let's roll the dice again. So I threw myself into that experience, and that was a very, very, it's a very different experience, mm-hmm. um, a lot shorter experience. The Bachelor is filmed over three months, whereas here in Fiji, that's filmed over a couple of weeks. So it's two weeks. Wow. You know, very intense, where they just turn the cameras on at midday and they don't stop rolling at all. So they get a lot of footage, but mm-hmm. um, it's a lot shorter, intensive sort of okay. experience. So yeah, very different. And the pressure's different, isn't it? Because you're changing each, I guess, well, we see it as every week. Yeah. But it's essentially, it must be like every day or so. So true. The girls have the power, then the boys have the power. and Yeah. And and that pressure to find someone and make a connection. and Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's As I said, it's a very different experience. Mm. It? And what I think the public sees is that it's broken up over weeks, but it, yeah. that's happening within days. So. Wow there is that pressure to kind of feel like you have to find a connection mm. with someone. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I struggled with that. So it was a, a process which I was, I didn't know what to expect. Mm. And in some ways, I think, as I, as I keep saying, that's a good thing if you, you throw yourself into situations that you just find challenging and you, and you learn a lot about yourself. So, yeah. so it was, it was a very different experience. But in hindsight, you know, you look back at it and lots of lessons learned and, and I'm grateful for that in, in some ways. So... Um, yeah. Yeah. I can, I just, again, I mean, if the mansion experience is intimidating in my mind, I can only imagine that then going to Fiji and having a cast of who knows how many kind of rolling through the door and there hadn't been an Australian version before Mm. your season of Bachelor in Paradise. So were you really prepared for what you were walking into or? No idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really had no idea. Um, I, I hadn't watched any of the uh, that, that American one's been going for a while, so I didn't yeah. even watch that. Probably should have. That would have maybe given me a bit more of an idea of what I was walking into. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, open book. Literally just walked in there and said, how does this work? And they, yeah. I just flew by the seat of my pants and was just yeah. like, okay, let's just go with the flow here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was such a journey, yeah. 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 Do you think you'd do it again? You know, I would. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would. And as, as I keep saying, like, even if things, you know, however things turn out, ups, downs, roller coaster, I think life is really meant to be experienced, highs and lows. Mm. And as I keep saying, putting yourself in the situations where you do feel uncomfortable, where yeah. you, you are kind of growing and 
feeling pain or, or even the other end is where you sometimes you can really kind of get carried away with the ego type yeah. of things where you're like, oh my God, look at all this attention and that. Yeah. So how to practice humility and bring yourself mm. back down to earth, stay grounded. So yeah, so I, I would do it again. And I do say to people who are resistant to it, to go, well, have a think about it. You know, just yeah. could re- learn a lot about yourself and through doing something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because as we're talking, I'm sort of reminded about some of your journey and how it's not that different to Alicia's story in the sense that she had a lot of negative attention the first time around and then really positive after her Batch in Paradise experience. And you kind of had the reverse of that. Mm. You came out like a hero from Sophie's season. And then, you know, you and Lisa had this love story Mm. that went the way that a lot of relationships do. But then there was a lot of negative attention around that. So how do you go from being Mm. seen so positively and everyone just loving you to then maybe starting to get some of those nasty comments and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean... Uh, the good thing is is that I had that meditation practice throughout yeah. the whole experience and I really do kind of fall back on that when you have those uh, extreme sort of moments within life yeah. so when you get the attention and things are great mm. as I said your ego tends to kind of can take over and you know you're like oh I'm the best thing since sliced bread yeah. so something like meditation is great in the way that it can bring you back down to earth mm. ground you keep that humility there so you know, I try to use that and keep that in mind when after, say, the first show when things were like, oh, yeah, everyone's like, wow. Yeah. You know, and then obviously the breakdown of uh, mine and Lisa's relationship, mm-hmm. you know, that was that was really tough and there's a lot there which I, I tried to keep personal and mm-hmm. I knew that if I probably went into the detail of what happened that I don't know whether she would have been able to handle it. Mm-hmm. So I took a lot of that on the chin and did cop a... a fair bit around that and had to go again to something like meditation which helped me out to be able to get through it and relate you know to a lot of people that often kind of say things that whether it's trolling or nasty or something like that are often going through hard times or have gone through something which they've been affected by you know something in a relationship very similar so you know I always really do try to implore empathy with things like that because I don't know what's going on in their life yeah so that's the way i I really tried Mm. to deal with it yeah and going through those ups and downs so yeah yeah i mean it's i I can't imagine what it would be like to have strangers commenting on your life and Mm. having very strong opinions and and so on but there's been a lot of talk recently about the responsibility of TV networks and mm. particularly in relation to reality TV and the obligation to the mental health of the contestants. Yeah. And some people say, you know, there's plenty of support and, you know, there's access whenever you want it. And other people say, well, actually, no, there's really limited support and it ends as soon as you're off the show and yeah. you're not aware of who you can call and, and what's available. So, yeah. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on... Yeah, I, I think uh, it's a... Good question. It's an interesting topic. They do provide access to a psychologist throughout the process. Mm -hmm. And I remember she was lovely and particularly their post directly after Mm -hmm. the show as well that you can have access to. But that, I mean, they go through, there's like three different types of variations of the Bachelor franchise now a year. Uh, So they move through contestants, if you want to call them that, Mm -hmm. quite quickly. So even though it's there initially, which is great for that, short-term support if you need it 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 can drag on Mm -hmm. you know a lot of people that maybe a few years like it's been nearly two years now since i went through the process i I know that some people that are that were in my season now are still struggling from it so definitely could be more done there of maybe ongoing Mm -hmm. um but then also in the hindsight is leading into it they don't want to (laughs) they don't want to give you too much of an insight into how things are going to pan out mm. because that's where the drama happens right yeah. if they if the producers and everyone told you hey this is how you can expect this yeah then a lot of the stuff wouldn't happen mm. you know so yeah. and that's kind of a little bit sneaky but mm. that's the whole point of the show i suppose so yeah. I'm, I'm not sour about that yeah you know you've got you do have to take some self-responsibility of knowing what you're signing up for mm. 
So, um, but in saying that, I do think if I was to comment on it, I do think there should be more long term support, yeah. so occasional reaching out, whether it's three, six, a year, two years, yeah, of just someone to say, "Hey, how you doing? Yeah, can we do anything?" Mm. There's none. There's none of that. I mean, yeah. So yeah. That, I think there could be more done there. Yeah, and I think as you say, like you might going into one of these things, you might think about, okay, these are the potential outcomes, mm. but then. Anything can happen on the show. You don't know how you're actually going to react or how people are going to take what you're saying or how you're being portrayed and how you're being put up against other people in certain ways. And, yeah, I mean, the impact that that can have throughout then social media, yeah, yeah. Suppose, it, as you say, can be very lasting and can have very negative effects. So I guess mm. in your case, you're lucky that you've already had that meditation background. You're already used mm. to grounding yourself and finding a way to tune all of that out yeah yeah I, I, to be honest with you i'm very lucky uh fortunate to have mm-hmm. that and that's why i'm so passionate about what i do right now yeah. is i know the power of what it can do and mm-hmm. how much it can help people that are going through certain things within their life you know so that just it's just given me even more confidence and determination to push on and to try to introduce it to more people in a way which is relatable accessible that's Pretty much just my mission now is to make that happen. So how exactly are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mostly break my time up now in two things. Mm-hmm. So I run a small consultancy, um, wellness consultancy. So we do a lot of work in the corporate sector, mm-hmm. pretty much just helping them de-stress yeah. because I think a lot of the people in the CBD and who are caught up in the concrete jungle mm-hmm. and that nine to five sort of rat race, if you want to call it like that, yeah. probably need a little bit more, you know, relaxation chilled out and de-stressing so um and it's a skill isn't it you've really got to learn how to do that yeah it's you know what it 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 is it and it isn't you know i my biggest tip when people come into meditation is to honestly let go of all the expectations of what you're wanting it to do for you right and just simply enjoy the process Mm. like just let it take you wherever it wants to take you yeah Because what I found out, particularly when I went into it, was I treated it like a lot of other things that we do in our life. It's like, how do I master this? How do I then go from this step to the next step? You know, as we do in our fitness and career and so forth. And that approach often you get frustrated with meditation is because if you're coming from this wanting space, Mm. then it almost puts up this roadblock. But if you let go and surrender to the process in itself, that's when the magic really starts to happen. Mm. So in a way of saying, don't try to learn it, if that makes sense. (laughs) I know it can sound a bit odd, but really just let it do what it wants to do. Mm. Just kind of let yourself just kind of melt into the moment and just let it take you wherever it wants to take you. So. Yeah, it, it, it's a funny thing because it can be quite frustrating and confusing to talk people through that yeah. because it's so different in how we approach a lot of other areas in our life. So totally. yeah. that's how I would recommend people if they are looking to get into it to do that. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's like, um, yeah, we kind of got a, a bit off there. <laughs> <laughs> but these, so, these are important points. I, I yeah. actually watched one of your videos on Instagram mm-hmm. and it really stayed with me and I've shown so many people this. You were talking about how when you're going into meditation and pe- mm. and so many people, I know I've had this experience when you're trying to just focus on your breathing or focus on being in the moment mm. and your thoughts just start coming in mm. and you start noticing all your thoughts and then you start freaking out that you're noticing all your thoughts <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, I'm not doing it properly. And I think mm. you said something like, that's great. If the thoughts are coming in, let them be there. Like, yeah. that's all part of it. 100%. In fact, that is an essential part of meditation mm. is catching yourself when you find yourself wandering off. Mm. That's like, the, it's, it's the point where if you were to relate it to kind of in a fitness term, it's like when that's your mind doing a bicep curl, mm. right? It's, a, it's an, a, a critical part of meditation. And yeah. it's often people find that when they find themselves wandering off, as you said, they get frustrated at that point because they feel like they're doing it wrong. Yeah. But in fact, that is really you are doing it right. Mm. That's like you becoming more self-aware. Yeah. And it's certainly something to be celebrated, not criticized. Mm. So it, it is, I spend a lot of my time helping people overcome the usual challenges and roadblocks when it comes to meditation. 
rather than talking about the benefits. I mean, everybody knows. I hear it so much. I should meditate. I should meditate. Yeah. Yes, there's so much benefits out there. Like, yeah. it'll do this for you, do that for you. And I mean, that gets flogged enough. But mm. helping people deal with these usual type of challenges and preconceived ideas, breaking them down is where I prefer to spend most of my time. And, and that's mm. a classic one of, yeah. I can't get my mind to switch off. And I'm like, you don't have to, right? Mm. If you switch off your brain, yeah. if you stop thinking, you're not going to be around for much longer. It's like mm. turning off another major organ in your body, right? You turn sure. your heart off, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to be around for much longer. So the yeah. whole concept of meditation with not thinking, I've never mm. really understood that because um, if you don't think, you you won't be here. Yeah. <laughs> you won't be around for much yeah. longer, right? Yeah. So it's more of a way of just being uh, controlling your thinking, directing it, observing your thinking, mm rather than not thinking because you cannot not think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That like that is so key for me because I know that even in yoga, you're doing shavasana at the end and you're lying there and it's meant to be that those few minutes of just like, mm. it's a, sort of a form of meditation. Absolutely. And yeah, the number of times that I would be frustrated with myself because then I'm thinking of the 400 million things that just float through mm. my mind and then thinking like, oh, stop it, Yana, just be. <laughs> but I guess, you know, that watching that video and hearing you say all of that now, it just like lets you off the hook. And I guess yeah. that opens up a whole world. If you're not feeling anxious about how you're doing it and I need to relax, I need to be focused and yeah. actually just be. Oh, that's so true. Yeah. yeah. It's, I know it sounds, it almost sounds too simplistic in some ways, mm. but it, it's, it's so true and it's and it's harder because as I said before is we have this uh, approach to almost every other area of our life yeah. with what's next, mm. the expectation of I've got to this point, what's next, what, yeah. how do I fix and move? Whereas meditation is really just being in the moment, mm. like just as you said, just be yeah. and thoughts will come in and even if you're wherever you're at and it's like noticing them and, and celebrating them. Yeah. And then just gently over and over again, bringing your focus back to a point of focus, whatever that might be. It could be a mantra, it could be your, your breath, yeah. it could be a, a, a sense that you feel within the body. Mm. Um, that's that's the exercise. Yeah, It's doing it over and over again. You wander off, you go, oh, yep, I've got to do, you know, I've got to take the washing out later yeah. on this afternoon. And, you, and then you go, huh, this, I often just laugh, smile. Oh, yeah, yeah. there's that thought. <laughs> cool, I'll just bring my focus back to my breath now. Yeah. And bring your focus back and then something else will come in. And, yeah. yeah. And that's, in a sense, is what meditation is. Yeah. Mm. So how long did it take you to get to that point where you could let go of all of that and get to that, I guess, level of proficiency mm. that people are, are probably hoping to get to? Oh, I still haven't gotten there. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, it doesn't stop. Yeah. Right. And I, and I think, again, there's that, there's that idea that I, I still think that the most seasoned, experienced meditators that have been doing it like monks for every day for hours... Mm. They still have thoughts coming to their head. Like, I mean, that's as it keeps saying, it's the brain's mm. job. What tends to happen is the gap between the thoughts will lengthen, mm. um, but it doesn't say it doesn't stop. Yeah, because that, that's impossible. Yeah, right. There's three main modes of what your brain moves between. It's the the future, the past, and the present. Mm. And we often it flickers from the past to the future, You're like a seesaw, like bang, mm. bang, 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 bang. And meditation is just trying to find that spot in the middle where it's a bit of peace. Yeah. Right? So it'll never stop. It'll just get maybe a little bit easier yeah. to find that middle space. Mm. And it'll, it'll generally last a little bit longer. Yeah. But I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, uh, like you're going to become enlightened. <laughs> and I even yeah. think now, like enlightened is not this place where you can constantly conscious and completely mm. present. If that was the case, if, if that's the goal, then why do we have uh, the subconscious? Yeah. Why weren't we created just being present beings? Yeah. So they're there for a purpose. Mm. Uh, and it's just being aware and knowing, okay, here's when I need to be in the past. Yeah. Here's when I need to think about the future. Mm. And here's also when I need to just be here now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Uh, it's so true that we are swinging between the past and the future all the time. I'm definitely mm. guilty of that. And so, <laughs> yeah, that's something I need to work on for sure. Yeah, it, it, that's happens. Like, as I said, the three modes is, is mm. constant. And the, the middle mode gets often forgotten, which yeah. is the present moment. And 
Uh, it's not to say that it's more important than the others. I think yeah. that's what a lot of people think that this sort of consciousness present moment is more important. Yeah. I think it's equally as important. It's just that we don't spend very much time there. Mm. Right. So we just need to be spending more time there. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and, you know, coming back to the other part where I spend my time is the, the new venture, which I've launched, which is Soul Alive, which I'm really excited about because I, I've been thinking about a way on how I can how I can make meditation more accessible yeah. to a lot more people and uh, affordable mm-hmm. uh, and relatable. And I think Soul Alive ticks those boxes now. So it's completely online. Each session is live streamed. So yeah. you have a live teacher there like me that will guide you through a different set class times and you yeah. can do it from home. So it's really accessible. It's a lot more affordable than having to go down to a yoga studio and doing a session for yeah. $25 class. And it, it's it's scalable as well. Like I can reach people wherever, really, yeah. to be able to get involved with it. So amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for that. And, and, you know, I'm at the point now where I'm doing what I can to start to get that out there and, and make people aware of it. So what can people expect? Like if, if someone's listening right now and they're thinking, oh, well, this sounds like pretty high level stuff. I've never done anything like this before. Mm. What would you say to that? Oh, it, it's, as I said, like I, I, I love breaking down preconceived ideas and I yeah. feel like a part of what my purpose is to do is to try to make meditation more relatable, yeah. understandable, easy and easy to do. Mm-hmm. So... I think it's, number one, making people feel comfortable Mm -hmm. and talking to them at their level. Yeah. Uh, I think I can relate to a lot of people because my journey is so varied. And growing up in, you know, Western culture, uh, I've done a lot of what people have gone through. Corporate sector, I was in the army. I've done this whole another world of reality TV. Mm. And um, so it's just understanding, talking to people at, at their level and saying, hey, I get what you're going through. I've yep. been there. I've probably gone through something very similar to you. Mm. Here's my journey. Yep. And breaking that down in a really just sort of easy to understand way. Yep. And again, just kind of overcoming these usual sort of skepticisms mm. around it. Like, I can't get my mind to switch off. And I'm like, yep. it's okay, you don't need to. Yep. In fact, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, yep. Coming back to the, the big tip, which is go into it with a, with a way of almost like childlike n- naivety, mm. a sense of curiosity, yeah. something that you uh, want to do rather than you feel like you need to do. Yeah. Get that enjoyment in it because that will make you want, want to do it more and more and more. Like treat it like it's your favorite meal, like you can't wait to look mm. forward to doing it again. Yeah. And just giving these people these type of tips yeah. to make them feel more comfortable, to really give it a go because yeah. it is such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So people can expect live meditations, mm. tips like like the ones you've been sharing with us today yeah. and just giving people a platform or maybe even permission mm. to focus on themselves Ta- for a window of time. That's so true and I say that a lot as well. It, it's really just taking some time for yourself. Mm. You know, like each class goes for about 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. We do three classes a week, one on Monday night, Wednesday night. Uh, and one early on on Friday mornings. Mm -hmm. The great thing is is even if you can't attend the live session, they're then saved for 24 hours afterwards, so you can still come and do the session at a time which works for you, which is a a cool feature. And as I said, like because it's online and it's all delivered via a platform which we're all very familiar with, which is Instagram, Mm -hmm. you can really hold a sense of accountability. So you know that someone's going to be there like a personal trainer, so the chances of you showing up are going to be a lot higher. Mm. Whereas I think um, a lot of the meditation apps out there, although I think they're amazing, yeah. they're pretty much all pre-recorded. Mm. So it really is up to you to be quite self-motivated to show up and do it. Yeah. And I know that you know they, they do their best to kind of send notifications to remind you and that, but I don't think there's anything better than seeing someone and having that sort of face-to-face contact. And yeah. it's pretty close to having like a, a going to a studio mm. and doing that live session. So I think it's hitting that sweet spot where you feel like you're a part of something. It's engaging. There's that sense of accountability. Yeah. So anyway, I'm excited That's for great. it. That's <laughs> great. No, it sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. You've shared a lot of mm. tips with us 
already, but is there is there one thing that people could maybe think about incorporating into their lives if you can't give yourself the time yet to really focus on meditation and having time for yourself? But is there one thing that busy people could think about doing to start them on the journey to wellness, I suppose? Outside of meditation? Or... Um, maybe, maybe let's think about the people that maybe haven't done anything like this before. Yep. And they're about to take a step towards yep. meditation. What would be the first thing do you think people... Ooh, I, I think removing yourself from your comfort zone, mm. I think is, is a great first step okay. because we get in autopilot mode a lot. Most of the time we're in autopilot mode. You know, we wake up, we do the same routine in the morning. You know, we get on the bus, we go to work, we come back, cook dinner, do the usual things, go to bed. Yeah. Right. So that's like the um, the autopilot moment. So uh, if you break that, that instantly almost forces you into becoming more conscious. Mm. It's like when you go traveling. Traveling is yeah. a great thing to do mm. as a first step to kind of pull yourself out of your, your funk yeah. and uh, start to explore more of that sort of consciousness space because mm. you're throwing yourself in that you have to be present. You yeah. have to kind of go, what bus do I need to catch next? Yeah. Or what plane, where do we need to go next rather than... I know where to walk exactly mm. now to get to there by this time. Yeah. So it forces you to be present. Mm. Um, so I think travel is such a great step, almost forcing yourself to be present. Yeah. And I, that's why people love it and they can't wait for holidays mm. is because you do tend to be quite present. Yeah. And once you've done that, then your creativity starts to flow. You often kind of you know, be more curious. And then that's when I might say, okay, well, we'll pick up a meditation book or subscribe to soul life (laughs) (laughs) love it okay i think they're great tips so where can people find soul alive and Mm -hmm. get in contact with you uh well everyone's i think social media is probably the the go-to point yeah so i mean my personal account is just my name it's just luke.mcleod on instagram i think again that's where people spend most of their time where i do you know share a lot of what i'm doing and with soul alive Mm. But Soul Alive also has its own account as well, which is Soul Alive underscore official. Yeah. Uh, and then the website itself. So it's just soulalive.com.au and that has everything on there. of Cool things around, you know, testimonials, feedback, community. Yeah. You can jump on there, read how other people have gone through it, what they've experienced, mm-hmm. which I think gives um, people a bit more confidence to yeah. giving it a go because they can read and see what other people, yeah. their feedback. Yeah. Um, so yeah, soulalive.com.au would be the place I would recommend people. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll make sure I put the links to all of those, the website and the Instagram accounts Mm -hmm. on the show notes. And if anyone has any questions for Luke, don't hesitate to get in touch with him. And I'm sure you'd be more than happy to answer any questions that arise. Yeah. More than happy to answer and do, I'll do my best anyway. (laughs) All right. Well, Luke, thank you so much for your time today. There's certainly a lot of things that I'll be taking away from this chat and implementing straight away. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me.